One day while exploring Morgantown, we stumble upon a sprawling college campus just east of Mama Dolce's. This is Vault Tech University. Just outside, we see a Vault Boy statue. He is holding a tablet inscribed with the Latin Post Tenebras Lux, which means light after darkness, which tells us a lot about what Vault Tech thinks of themselves. They will be the only light after the darkness of the apocalypse. Or at least, that's the message they wanted to teach to the students of their university. We see that the college spans three main buildings. We'll start by going up the stairs to the east and heading through the main red double doors. We arrive in a hallway. We find two doors to the left. Both lead to bathrooms. The first one is the women's bathroom. We see the remains of a mole rat on the ground. Looks like someone has been here before us. We don't find much else, so heading out, we see a ghoul. Hiding in the bathroom, we can pull out our hunting rifle. There's still something out there, but it's safe enough to move forward. We see a ruined bust and a display case, and then we can turn into the men's restroom. Here we find a skeleton lying on the john, with a Nuka-Cola cherry behind him. Back to the hallway, we arrive in a vaulted central room. It looks like this room connects many of the hallways and buildings of the university. We'll start by moving east. This short hallway just leads us to a big double door outside. From here, we could go and explore more of Morgantown, but let's finish with vault Tech University. Turning around, we see a big vault door on display next to a vault boy and a vault girl. No number on it, though, so it looks like it's just for decoration. Next, we'll go down the hallway to the south. As we pass by a bunch of folded chairs, we can go into the first room to the right. This is room A1, Facilities Management. It's filled with shelves. On one, we find a first aid kit. And right next to this is an armor workbench, which we can use to scrap our junk. In the southwestern corner of this room, we find the automated research terminal. vault -Tech University, students and staff only. Student hours 0600 to 2000. All holotape programs must be approved by faculty advisor. No gaming on this terminal at any times. Enter project passcode to proceed. We can examine the archived logs. Current admin has deleted all archived logs. Oh no. Well, what about the previous program results? And these have been deleted as well. I wonder why, after the apocalypse, vault -Tech University would go to the trouble to delete all of the research on this terminal. Backing out, we can finish exploring. Rounding a corner, we find a work desk. There's a magnifying glass on top. That's it for this room, so backing out, we can return to the hallway and continue south. Turning right into the next room, we see bunk beds on a platform. Moving south, we can loot more junk and scrap from some lockers. The tables have all been turned over, almost as if they had been used as barricades. This is presumably where some of the students slept, though it doesn't look like they would have had much privacy. Here we find a bunch of bunk beds, a couple of chairs for lounging around. Ooh, and a skeleton in one of the lockers. And he's handcuffed. Could this have been a college hazing prank gone bad? Whomever this was, his friends didn't let him out after the bombs dropped. And so here he died. The rest of this dormitory is just filled with minor junk. So heading back out to the hallway, we find the remains of another student clutching a pencil. We'll snag that lead for ammo crafting and then loot his lunch pail. We find a door to the east. Looks like this was an exercise room. Though again, it's elevated on a platform. Here we find a terminal. The Physical Health Development Terminal. Class Syllabus, Vault Health and Well-Being. Oh! And now it begins to make sense. It's not a real exercise room. This is a sample of what one might look like in a vault. And it's the same with what I thought was a dormitory. No, that was a cutout of what a private vault quarters might look like. The students would then sit at the tables beneath the platform to receive their instruction. In the first one, Introduction, one of the primary concerns for a vault overseer is the health and well-being of the vault's population. Through this course, vault Tech will instruct you on how to monitor, diagnose, and treat various health-related issues that can arise in one of our vaults. If you have any questions about the entries in this syllabus, please speak to a vault Tech University representative. In the first course, vault Tech University Health and Well-Being 101, Introduction to Dweller Health. This course is designed to introduce the physical aspects of vault dweller health and survival. The vault overseer will learn what makes their dwellers tick, 
what can potentially go wrong, and how to implement health and well-being solutions. As a bonus, you'll spend a weekend in one of our test vaults and experience the effects that recirculated air, recirculated water, and mild doses of radiation can have on the human body. Oh great, looks like being a student here means that you were part of the experiment as well. In the next one, 201, Introduction to Contaminants. The average vault contains approximately 673 possible contaminants, holy cow! This course will introduce the vault overseer to what we refer to as the TTC list, or the Top 10 Contaminants list. We'll cover the sources of these contaminants, their effects on the human body, and how to treat health issues that will arise from exposure. Finally, if your vault has been certified as an observation vault, the course will also cover how to introduce these contaminants at low enough levels to gather proper data points without long-term harmful effects. So it's even written into the course syllabus. These overseers in training knew that vault Tech was planning to experiment on the vault dwellers, at least in observation vaults. I wonder then why discovering the experiment came as such a surprise to the overseer of Vault 81, for example. In the next one, 304, Organic Recycling. All vaults are designed to be completely self-reliant and are equipped with the proper amount of food and water before they are sealed. In the unlikely event that one of these systems fails, or if said supplies are improperly distributed or lost, the vault overseer will have to implement organic recycling procedures. Ugh. This course will cover use and maintenance of vaults waste recycling systems and how to properly administer food and drink. The highlight of the course is our week-long waste sprint, where students are forced to survive using our sample recycling systems and their own waste. Ah! Oh. Parents who sent their kids to this college must have hated them. And in the final one, 410, Survival Through Cannibalism. This is an advanced study course that deals with the possibility that a vault can reach LAFFS status, lack of all food and food-like sources. <laughs> When food supplies are completely exhausted and the vault's recycling systems are offline, vault Tech has given all overseers permission to use any means necessary to ensure dweller survival. To achieve this goal, cannibalism may become necessary. This course will cover all aspects of cannibalism, including moral ramifications, corpse consumption safety, and how to make delicious side dishes using only hair and toenails. Come on, really? <laughs> oh no. Well, it is the apocalypse, and we know from the events of Fallout 3 in particular that cannibalism was widespread in the wasteland, at least 200 years after the bombs dropped. I guess vault Tech had enough foresight to see that coming. Backing out of the terminal, we can turn around. We find a first aid kit on a shelf. It was sadly empty in my game. Then we can head up to this platform. We see a bunch of showers and exercise bikes and weight benches set out. We find a stack of dumbbells to the east, great for lead, which we can use for ammo crafting, though really heavy. Might need to make a special trip for this stuff. And that's about it for the health and well-being research lab. Oh god, how many of these horrifying labs are there? Back out to the hallway and turning around, we see another door to Appalachia. Lots of ways to get in and out of this place. But that's it for this wing, so turning around, we can head back to the atrium. Next, we'll go upstairs. This leads to a mezzanine where we find a blue vault tech box that has the Overseer's Journal Entry 4. Overseer's Personal Journal. Four years of living, learning, and breathing vault tech. Graduating with honors in the Overseer track. Dad was so proud. Came out even though he was already so sick. I must have impressed the right people because I was offered the next available Overseer slot. I had just graduated. It was supposed to take years. Maybe they knew the war was inevitable. When I learned that 76 was going to be built, I was so excited I jumped right out of my chair and did a dance around the living room. Appalachia would be safe no matter what happened. Evan chose that moment to propose, a lughead. He knew I wouldn't say no after hearing the news. He knew me better than anyone. Dad died a few months after Evan and I moved in together. He really wanted to walk me down the aisle. Well, I didn't really get to walk down there either, so. Uh, 
I think it's time I went home. I owe Evan that much. So the Overseer has gone back to her home in Sutton. We'll continue with the Overseer's quest, Personal Matters, in another video. But for now, it seems we've discovered a lecture hall. This was on the western side of the atrium, opposite where we found the Overseer's holotape, and we've already found an end of dungeon steamer trunk, and all sorts of chems and booze where the students were sitting. <laughs> I guess that's how you get through a vault -Tec University lecture. Heading down, we can go behind the lecture desk to access the vault -Tec Mission Statement Terminal. vault -Tec Mission Statement Introduction vault -Tec University was established in response to the growing threat of nuclear annihilation that's facing our species. We've created a unique environment in which our diverse student population can immerse themselves in all facets of education related to survival in the face of imminent death. Thanks to our innovative vault system, we've developed a way for man to persevere in this cruel and unforgiving atomic world. vault -Tec University is confident that all graduates from this institution will be 100% ready to prepare for the future. In the next one, our staff, vault -Tec University prides itself in our highly educated and experienced staff. Every one of our professors undergoes a rigorous screening process that not only involves the normal background checks, but they are also required to live within one of our test vaults for the duration of their employment. There's absolutely no substitute for experience, and we believe that this makes our staff uniquely qualified to teach our courses. So the professors were forced to live in a vault -Tec test vault in order to keep their jobs? Golly. In the next one, our facility, vault -Tec University is a cutting-edge facility that features the latest and greatest innovations from our partners in both the government and private sectors. Our strategic partnership provides us access to such normally restricted technologies as advanced mainframes, military-grade robotics, and compact fusion power systems. We provide nothing but the best for our students because we believe they will eventually be the future leaders of our world. And in the final one, our promise, when a student graduates from vault -Tec University, they aren't simply receiving a piece of paper and a handshake. In actuality, they are being handed the keys to the future. When this planet is inevitably reduced to cinders and society is on the brink, we guarantee that our graduates will be the only people capable of guiding the survivors through the chaos. Consider yourselves proud when you walk these hallowed halls. As a student of vault -Tec University, you'll become one of the future shepherds of humanity. What you choose to do with that future is up to you. vault -Tec is very certain that the world will end. Perhaps too certain. Is this more evidence that they might have had a hand in it? Backing out, we can head out the door. We arrive back on the mezzanine and turning around. Yo! This bugger almost snuck up on me. Going east, we can loot more scrap and that completes the loop. Okay. So it looks like we need to go south. We could go down the hallway or through a big hole in the wall of the lecture hall. Heading through the hole first, we loot a first aid kit of a ghoul. And here we find a bunch of wooden crates with scrap inside, big stacks of vault -Tec boxes, archival cabinets that are sadly empty, and a weapons workbench. Let's scrap all our junk. On one of the filing cabinets we find a cooler. Here I found a recipe for Myrler cake. It'll come in handy. But that's it for this room. So heading back out to the hallway we can turn south. At the end of the hallway we find one room to the east. B3, the food preparation lab. This has a layout like all the others. We can take care of a ghoul. Near to the door, we find a wall-mounted first aid kit. And then heading up to the mock kitchen, we find scrap a few foodstuffs and then a recipe for silt bean puree. But this is not a rare recipe. I've already gotten a couple of them. And that's it for this wing. Remember when we opened the door to the northern wing, we just saw a bricked up wall. So that leaves only one path left to explore, and that's to go back down to the floor of the atrium and head down the northern hallway. At the end of this hallway, we find a door that leads to a vault with wandering ghouls. We arrive on the second floor of this vault's atrium. We don't find anything up here, so we'll take a staircase down to the ground floor. We find shelves with scrap to the west. Turning around, we find a locked door to the south. We'll come back to that in a minute. 
Continuing to explore the perimeter, we find fusion generators in the middle. These appear to be disabled. Let's see if we can repower them using the power terminal on a wall to the east. After hacking it, we find one option to access the maintenance logs. But when we do, authorized personnel only data corrupted. So sadly, we can't repower this vault. It may have had problems before the bombs dropped. We find a ladder and a toolbox here. Perhaps someone was working on it. All we find to the east are a bunch of boxes and shelves. That makes this a dead end, and it makes the southwestern door our only path forward. Accessing the terminal, simulation vault entrance. Oh, so this isn't a real vault. It's a simulation vault. Training and Development Division. In the first one, previous simulation status. Result, failure. Total loss of life. Does that mean total loss of real life or simulated life? Hope they weren't experimenting on real people. In the next one, simulation vault current status. Vault has been cleaned by automated systems and is ready for the next simulation. Okay. In the next one, upcoming simulation status, no plans available, system awaiting setup instructions. So we can't program a new simulation, but perhaps we can explore what remains of the last one. And to do so, we can activate the security door control. The nearby sliding door opens and we can head down into the simulation vault. At the bottom, we can loot some lockers for scrap and we arrive on a second level overlooking a staircase. Heading down the staircase, it wraps around to the west, and we arrive in a vault corridor, leading to another atrium and two rooms on either side. We'll explore the left room first. This appears to be a vault classroom. Study hard, for your overseer, for America. But presumably since it was a simulation, we don't find much here. A little bit of scrap, a globe on the desk, some scrap on a tool case, and then a few dressers in the rear of the classroom. Oh, a Mr. Handy. Maybe this was one of the robots that cleaned the place after the last simulation. Heading out, instead of going into the atrium, we can go across the hallway. This was the clinic, med bay, hospital. We find beds and chem coolers, lockers. There is a floor safe here, but I couldn't pick it. It requires a lockpick skill of level three. After looting this place of all the scrap we can carry, we can head back out and now explore the atrium. We see Mr. Handy is walking around down there. I wonder if they're still cleaning. If we take the bridge across the atrium, we arrive at residential. Here we find a pool table. Turning right, we find a simulation bunk room, lockers and beds, a cooler, and it looks like there's a vault suit on one of these dressers, but sadly we can't loot it. Every now and then we'll find a static world object like this that you'd think we could loot, but we sadly can't. Crossing the hall, we find another barracks, more scrap in the lockers, and otherwise empty. So heading back out to the atrium, we have to decide which way we're gonna go, north or south. We'll start by heading south. This leads to screening. At the end of the hallway, we find a bank of lockers. There's a door to the east, but it's inaccessible. So turning around, we can go through the door to the west. This leads to showers and a locker room. From the locker room, we strangely find a staircase leading up. Taking it all the way to the top, we arrive at some sort of observation room, but it's completely destroyed. On the wall behind us, we find another wall-mounted terminal that talks about the vault simulation, but it has all the same entries we read earlier. There's a window overlooking the atrium. I'm assuming this may be where professors and other students observed the vault simulation in progress. This must be a classroom. We see a teacher's desk in the southwestern corner, but here we find a staircase leading up to yet another floor. Here we find more windows peering out to the vault, whoop, and a ghoul. <laughs> Heading inside, it looks like an office. On the wall we see a sign, vault simulation in progress. On the ground we find skeletons wearing vault suits. Could these be the professors, or maybe some of the other students? To the west, we find another red double door leading back out to Appalachia. We've managed to explore into one of the other attached buildings of vault University. So instead of going back outside, let's retrace our steps back to the vault atrium to finish exploring the simulation vault. 
On the north side of this atrium, we see an overseer's window. Before we head that way, however, let's head downstairs to explore this bottom floor. Immediately to the left, we find a maintenance room, but sadly, no matter how we try to activate it, we don't have access. So moving east, we find a cafeteria, lots of trays and scrap laid out. On one of the counters, we find a recipe for blood bug pepper steak. Sounds delicious. Moving north, we find supplies against the wall, some purified water, scrap and some lockers, and then a door to some showers to the west. There's not much here. We find some soap in the northeastern corner. Turning around, we can loot a mirror above a sink, and on top of the mirror is a lockpicking bobblehead. Always try for the unobtainable. When used, gain a 30% wider sweet spot when lockpicking for one hour. With that, we've explored everything down here, so retracing our steps, we can head upstairs and explore the final door, the door to the north, to the overseer. The hallway rounds a corner and then goes upstairs. Turning off our light and crouching down, the stairs puts us out in the overseer's office. We see a terminal on a desk, and then a stack of skeletons in a pile outside a closed door. The skeletons are all wearing VT Vault Tech jumpsuits, and they were holding folding chairs and brooms as if they were using them to try and beat down this door. But why? Turning around, we find another simulation vault entrance terminal on the wall, and on the overseer's desk, the overseer's log terminal. Perhaps this will give us the answers we need. Project Lembas, overseer's log. Lembas? Is that a Tolkien reference? In the first one, October 15th, Overseer's Log, October 15th, 2077. T minus one day until my test run starts. I did the final walkthrough with my advisors before getting locked in. The students will be here tomorrow to test my hypothesis that using a calorically dense food paste of my own formulation is superior to standard supplies, and that my flavoring system will create enough variety so that dwellers won't get bored. Oh, so it is a Tolkien reference. Lembas, the super food of the elves, giving the hobbits strength on their journey, this food paste created by the overseer to do the same thing, presumably. In the next one, on the 16th, the very next day, my dwellers have arrived. After a brief orientation, I've given them time to adjust to one another, the parameters of the experiment, and their respective roles. I plan on giving an address later today. The next day, on the 17th, we are on full lockdown and everything is running smoothly. Unless I signal to my advisors, we are in this until the time locks release four weeks from now. So far, the test is going well and feedback has been positive on the food paste formulation. Two days later on the 19th, the dwellers are eating even less of the experimental formulation than I expected. They report full bellies and satisfactory metabolisms. Oh, either that means it was really filling or they just didn't want to eat it. Four days later, on October 23rd, the day the bombs dropped, it felt like something happened on the outside today, almost like an earthquake, and we lost power in the vault temporarily. The dwellers were able to quickly restore power via the backup generators. I assume that this is part of a drill, and my people performed admirably. But it wasn't part of a drill. It was the end of the world. In the next one, three days later on the 26th, a heart attack. Sudden and out of nowhere, one of the maintenance staff died in the middle of his workday. I'm waiting on the coroner's report before I make any decisions. Uh-oh. Something wrong with that food paste then? The next day, the coroner did a full autopsy. It looks like it wasn't a heart attack, but the arterial walls of the heart hardened and cracked. I've ordered a medical review of the control group and members of the test group. Wow. It cracked? That's some intense artery hardening. What could explain this? The very next day, on the 28th, it's conclusive. My food paste formulation caused arterial plaque buildup. There were no signs of buildup in the control group, so I've ordered the dwellers to take stock of the remaining standard issue food to see if we have another week left in us. It was the paste. The very next day... More bad news. My food paste was not as popular as I thought. Apparently a black market for standard rations cropped up, and we only have two days for everyone in the vault. So they were eating the standard food all this time, because they didn't like the taste. That's why they weren't going through it quickly, but now this means they're short of actual food to get them through the experiment. I want to try and figure a solution to this problem before I signal my advisors to end the test prematurely. This is my senior thesis experiment, and if I fail, I won't be able to operate as a full overseer. 
Yeah, that and people gonna die. Might want to consider that. Two days later, October 31st. The dwellers are threatening to revolt if I don't call the experiment. They burned through the rations quicker than we thought and now are getting scared. I am going to signal my advisors and cancel the test. I can't take the chance that we're going to lose anyone else. Well, at least this overseer did the right thing in the end. But too little too late. On November 1st, we learn, no response from the outside. The dwellers think that I'm lying to them and are threatening to storm my office. I'm not sure if I can hold off a full offense for two full weeks. And in the final one, November 2nd, they've breached the outer seal and are at the door to my office. I can hear the drill operating. Drums in the deep. Oh, wait, no, sorry. It'll take them days to get through, but I can't take the chance. I don't know why my advisors aren't responding. People are dying here and more are going to die and there's nothing I can do about it. This will be my final entry before I barricade myself in the bedroom in hopes that I can outlast the timed locks. God willing, this is just part of the test. Something tells me it's not. So this is why we find all of the bodies at the door. These were the vault dwellers trying to get into the overseer's office, but they couldn't get the door open. And when the terminal upstairs said total loss of life, it meant total loss of real life. Everyone in the vault died. Moving northeast, we find more bodies holding fire extinguishers in front of this door. Perhaps this one goes outside and they couldn't get it open either. Opening the door, sure enough, a staircase leading up. But the experiment is over. That means the vault is unsealed and all the locks have been unlocked. Opening the overseer's door, we find the overseer dead in bed. There's a can of rat poison beneath his bed and a rag in his hand. The overseer committed suicide. Rather than wait the two weeks for the vault to unseal itself, rather than face his vault dwellers, he poured rat poison on a cloth, put the cloth over his mouth, and killed himself. We find scrap in a footlocker at the foot of his bed, but not much else here. Looks like to leave, we need to head up the stairs. The stairs put us out into another office. This one doesn't have a window, so it can't be an observation room. The terminals here are all blasted out and we just find scrap in the containers. To leave, we open a door to the north. Oh, oh, that's right. It's a fake vault. Opening the door, we can turn left. No, turn right. Ah, oh, doggone zombies. My more coming. Oh. Looking right down the hallway, we see a large room. Turning west, the hallway is very long. We'll start by going down this long western hallway. We find a door to the north. Heading inside looks like another classroom. We find a simulated med bay. With minor containers to loot, we find a stim pack on a table beneath some x-rays. There's a terminal on the desk. We'll explore that in a minute. Turning around, we see a hole in the wall to another hallway. This leads to a door that leads back out to Appalachia. Okay, so that's a dead end. Back into the classroom. We can read what's on the terminal. Class syllabus, vault medical training. Introduction, a vault overseer is responsible for taking on many roles. Administrator, adjudicator, spiritual leader, and sometimes doctor. This course is specifically focused on the latter, teaching students how to diagnose and treat most medical emergencies. This is a highly intensive course. Completion of the vault health and well-being course syllabus is required. All right, so a required intensive course. In vault -Tec University vault -Tec Medical Training 101, Introduction to Medical Diagnoses. The first step in tackling a medical issue is through proper diagnosis. This course will instruct students on how to use a vault's medical equipment and facilities to identify and categorize medical issues. This intensive three-month course culminates in a weekend-long residency at the AVR Medical Center in Appalachia, where you will assist actual doctors in their diagnoses of emergency room patients. They helped diagnose patients in emergency rooms after being trained for only three months? All right, let's make a note to ourselves. AVR Medical Center. Let's see if we can track it down and explore it later. In the next one, 201, skin disorders and you. Is it acne or is it a flesh-eating bacterium? There are literally thousands of potential issues that can affect the skin of the typical vault dweller. This course will teach proper identification techniques and suggested treatments of skin disorders. The course's final exam will involve a blindfolded touch and taste test. Oh, since it's highly possible an overseer may have to diagnose and administer these treatments in the dark. Oh, really? Oh, I can see it already. Doctor, there's a growth on my cheek. Well, let me touch and taste that. Ugh. Though I guess we can't fault vault Tech for not being thorough. In 290, limb replacements, a primer. Did you know that the second most likely medical hazard in a vault involves the total loss of a dweller's limb? 
what's the first most? This course will instruct students on how to properly reattach severed limbs, as well as how to create substitute limbs from common household items. We'll also teach students advanced techniques such as substituting arms in place of legs, limb donation screening, and experimental lab-grown limb technology. Uh, sign me up for the last one, if any. And in the final one, 402, Advanced Surgical Techniques. This course will fully certify students to perform complex surgical procedures, such as organ transplants, tumor removal, and mutation extractions. Normally, studying to be a surgical doctor can take as long as 8 to 10 years. Using vault patented Speed Teach system will reduce that study time to only 3 months. Ugh. Important! Registering for this course requires all students to purchase vault Tech Malpractice Protection Certificate form blah blah blah, which is available in the bursar's office. <laughs> oh, vault Tech, never change. Moving out of this room back into the hallway, we find a hallway crossing our path. We find the door out to the north. Heading south on the hallway, we find another door out. So back to the intersection, we can move west, where we find another door to the right with ghouls. Looks like this was a classroom lab. After looting scrap from the dressers and wood on the ground for campfires, we find a terminal on the table, Young Dweller Development Terminal. Oh no, what horrors lie in here. Class syllabus, preteen vault dwellers, oh great. Introduction. One of the duties of a vault overseer may involve becoming a surrogate parent or dispensing advice to actual parents of young dwellers. vault -Tech will instruct you on how to deal with one of the most difficult classifications of children, the preteen, ages 10 to 12 years of age. If you have any questions about the entries in this syllabus, please speak to a vault -Tech University representative. In 101, Introduction to Preteen Dweller Maintenance. Maintenance? This course is designed to introduce the mechanics of preteen physiology. The focus will be primarily regarding maintenance and upkeep while they're talking about these kids as robots, including things that can go wrong with the preteen's body. Students will be instructed how to repair common issues and deal with physiological emergencies. Please note that this course includes laboratory dissection work. Oh no! So the proper biohazard equipment will be issued after registration is complete. These guys were dissecting kids? For science? Oh, in the next one, 201, Introduction to Preteen Psychology, preteens feature the most complex psychology of any age group. This course will equip the vault overseer with the proper armament to handle an array of preteen psychological issues that may arise within their vaults. Learn how to cope with such issues as preteen angst, tantrums, outright defiance, whining, laziness, and self-motivation. The course will also instruct the vault overseer on how to draw up behavioral contracts and to find consequences for preteens who breach outlined obligations. So vault -Tech's solution to preteen angst is to have the kids sign behavioral contracts? Somehow, that doesn't surprise me. In 222, puberty in confined environments. Oh God, I don't want to read this. Many young vault dwellers will reach the puberty stage during their preteen years. This course will enable the vault overseer to understand the changes that are occurring in these budding youths and become their mentor if necessary. Explanation of physical and psychosocial behavioral changes is covered in the course as well as how to explain these changes to preteen dwellers in a way they'll understand. Also included will be how to properly administer and explain the vault -Tech Puberty Welcome Kit or VTPWK, which should be presented to all preteen dwellers once they've achieved this growth milestone. Imagine seeing that as a Vault Boy video. And in the final one, 401. Preteens in the workforce, although a preteen can range from only 10 to 13 years of age, they certainly qualify for a variety of jobs in the average vault. This course is specifically designed to explain the difficulties of various tasks and which ones are optimal for the preteen dweller. The course also deals with occupational safety considerations when assigning preteens to tasks involving nuclear, biological, or chemical environments. Brilliant! Put a kid next to some nuclear radiation while he's going through puberty. That's just fine! Heading out of this room, we find another door back outside to the west, but we've awoken something. Continuing east on the hallway, we find one door left to explore. 
We see consoles and scientific equipment in this classroom, but the floor above has created a rubble ramp that we can use to climb to the second floor. We arrive in a dizzying mess of offices and cubicles. Exploring to the southeast, we find a number of containers to loot and a bunch of blasted out terminals. There's a door to the east that leads to a hallway, a dead end to the south, and a path to an intersection to the north. Okay, it's starting to make a little bit more sense. Looks like we climbed up into one office that had completely crumbled down. But taking the hallway to the west, we find the door that leads to a teacher's office, Professor M. Blake. His office is mostly empty, but we do find his terminal on a desk. Terminal Blake Michael. Warning, unable to connect to university intranet. Only offline files and directories accessible. In the first one, we find a course syllabus template, and that's exactly what it is, just a template, nothing interesting. Backing out, we find notes to self. In the first one, Horse Creek Petroglyphs. Had a chance to go study the Horse Creek Petroglyphs in person. I've been meaning to do so ever since moving to West Virginia. They have always fascinated me. The idea that Europeans landed in North America and traveled that far inland during the 6th or 7th century is fascinating. Now, whether it was written in Old Irish Ogham, Bosque, or some other ancient language is up for debate. Personally, I prefer the Bosque translation, as it paints a vivid picture of a great bison hunt. But regardless, it's exciting to study and theorize about any petroglyphs in our own backyard. So, there are ancient petroglyphs nearby. We'll have to keep our eyes open for them. In the next one, Jacqueline. Jacqueline brought more of her notes around the other day. Still not sure what to make of those runes. They don't match any of the native petroglyphs in the area, nor do they match any of the old European runes I would have expected. Still, I'm confident I'll find a match somewhere, and if not, there may be enough to go on to piece together a rough idea of what they say, if anything. I'm beginning to think it may be nonsense, but I am intrigued. Uh-oh, what could this be? Alien languages? Or maybe something to do with the occult? And in the final one, VTU, ever since Vaultech bought out the university, they've been shifting focus away from classical education and moving towards more specialized classes. I've seen several other professors get the boot, but thankfully, I seem to have been spared thus far. I should feel lucky they believe language is a skill worth preserving in the event society collapses and we all need to move underground. Backing out of notes to self, we find Guidestone Translation. Jacqueline has instructed me that she would feel safer if I moved the translation key offline. The woman is paranoid, but I don't disagree that it's for good reason. It is because of this that she insists on keeping the original notes with her. She says it's for the best, just in case someone gets to one of us, so none of us have all the pieces. Even Agent Wilson's taking precautions. We could be onto something big here. Then again, I still maintain the runes are simply ancient petroglyphs left by the indigenous peoples of the region. Jacqueline believes they may be extraterrestrial in nature, but I'll stick with Occam's razor on this one. The hypothesis, with the fewest assumptions, is often the correct one. Wisdom, Professor, but we at least know that aliens exist in this universe. Could Jacqueline be right? Did she find alien writing? And if so, what did it say? And who is Agent Wilson? And why were they all fearing for their lives? This leaves us with a lot to do. We have to track down the Horse Creek petroglyphs, just to satisfy our curiosity, and then Jacqueline, because she has the translation notes for the Guidestone with her. With this room explored, we can continue east down the hallway. At the intersection, we turn north and move into the western room. This looks like a faculty lounge. We find the skeleton of a woman wedged between a couch and a coffee table. There's some dirty water on a shelf, another skeleton on the ground behind us, and a man slumped over in a chair. After loading some purified water, we can move back out to the hallway. Going north down the hallway, we find a women's restroom to the left. Nothing in here. And turning around and crossing the hall, we find the men's restroom. And nothing in here. This leaves one room in this hall. Hallway, and that's through the door to the east. Here we find the door to the office of the Dean of Overseer Training. Heading inside, we see a big hole in the wall. Looks like we'll have to be quiet so nothing finds us through there. And then we see the Dean's desk. There's a floor safe on the ground behind him, and his terminal is labeled Dean Harland Elliott's Workstation. And it's locked. But thankfully, it's an easy hack. Inside, we find student thesis evaluations. The first one, Liam Hornwright. 
My understanding is that Mr. Hornwright is attending school primarily to party and spends the majority of his time in a haze of marijuana, hence his absurd and hastily banged out proposals. However, his family connections make him a potential liability, so we will have to see how we will handle his future training. H. Elliot. So it looks like not even vault University was able to completely avoid nepotism. In the next one, Drew Collingsworth. Collingsworth's proposed experiment has evolved beyond my wildest expectations. His initial proposal mirrored other successful food replacement schemes and even showed a little imagination for once. I pushed him towards a more interesting experiment that should test the general willpower of individuals and how they react to deaths caused by food supply. I've tasted his pastes, they're suitably horrible, so we're going to mass produce them and add an arterial placking agent that should cause rapid circulatory system decline. I expect a full-blown revolt within two weeks and we should be able to end the experiment in the middle of week three. H. Elliot. The Dean sabotaged the overseer's food paste experiment. No wonder it took the overseer by surprise. The food paste he developed was bland and tasteless, but otherwise healthy wouldn't cause anyone harm. But just to see what would happen, to test the general willpower of individuals and how they react to deaths around them, the dean sabotaged the food supply, which ultimately led to the deaths of everyone in the simulation vault. Though to be fair, he was helped by the apocalypse. In the next one, Shelby O'Rourke, Student Thesis Evaluations. O'Rourke has proven to be persistent enough to convince me to grant her a small amount of funding for her thesis project to provide evidence of so-called cryptids. Should she prove the existence and have appropriate data, this would be a major breakthrough that vault can surely benefit from. If anything, it gets her out of my hair for a few months. Should she not return within her given time period, we'll need to find a team to locate wherever she hold up and retrieve any data for investigation. H. Elliot. This adds a miscellaneous quest to our quest log. Find Shelby O'Rourke's shack. We'll follow up with Shelby O'Rourke in a later video. We can finally select Safe Control to disengage the lock. This allows us to loot the floor safe, where we find a bunch of goods and I found a calibrated hunting rifle. Moving through the hole in the wall. This office is a bit of a wreck. We find containers and scrap, but no terminals to read. So, moving out to the hallway, we find another ghoul. Directly across the hall is the computer lab. After clearing it, we find a lot of scrap to loot. And we find a terminal, Liam Hornwright's workstation. Wait a minute. We know that name. We read it on the Dean's terminal. This was the guy so high on marijuana that he kept coming up with bad ideas, but he came from a powerful family. Let's see exactly what his thesis was. Abstract, an experiment for determining the ability of canines to form a self-governing society. Basically, the experiment will involve a group of dogs trained to train other dogs to perform typically human-run tasks. I've begun training my miniature schnauzer, Riley, to operate vault doors, which I think is a promising start to the experiment. I'd be happy to bring her in any time to demonstrate. <laughs> oh, Liam! I think this guy may be in the wrong place. Advisor response, Mr. Matthews, this proposal lacks any kind of substantial value and makes me seriously question your devotion to the project of the preservation of the human race. Please see me and we can talk about a serious proposal, if you can manage to find my office, which is hilarious because it's right across the hall. Best, Dean Harland Elliott, President Overseer Training Advisory Board. Well, a dumb idea, sure, but probably the most harmless experiment description we've read so far here in vault U. Next to this terminal is Drew Collingsworth Workstation. Drew Collingsworth was the name of the food paste overseer whose skeleton we found with rat poison in the simulation vault. Abstract, an experiment for determining the optimal density of calories in a foodstuff versus storage space. This experiment will test the tolerance of various individuals' ability to consume food of unvarying texture, but allow them to design flavors or use pre-created flavors. In this experiment, there will be a control group that uses a standard regimen of vault supplies and an experimental group that subsists on nothing but my proprietary food paste formula. See attached materials. Oh, this poor guy. Such passion into his work only to be sabotaged by the Dean. 
In the next one, proprietary food paste formulation, ingredients are as follows. And while we have quite a list of ingredients, looks like the paste consisted primarily of dried yellow peas. Then garbanzo beans and then pea protein and everything else is under 10%. In the next one, proposed flavor profiles. Below are a list of potential flavor profiles and components that dwellers can use to create new meals. Base flavorings, sweeteners, and then a bunch of sweeteners, bittering agents, ground ivy, bog myrtle, marigold, groot, souring agents, a whole lot of stuff, salts. No salt will be provided as it is part of the base paste. Oh, okay. Texturing all preparations will have the same texture. That's what nauseates me about this and then a variety of spices. Pre-mixed flavorings, almond, banana, beet, brewer's yeast, chili, chicken, cappuccino, fish, yeah, imagine sucking down some fish paste, herring, honey, lemon, lime, and liver, <laughs> oatmeal, orange, peppermint, general red meat, and sour cream. Mm. And in the final one, advisor response, Mr. Collingsworth, your proposal has come a long way, and the board has agreed to give you one month of vault time starting on October 15th of this year. We will accelerate your leadership classes and pull you from unrelated or less important classes. Congratulations, Dean Harland Elliott, President Overseer Training Advisory Board. Little did Mr. Collingsworth know that the Dean was sabotaging his entire experiment. These are the final two terminals in this room. After looting a few more containers for scrap, we can head out and then follow the hallway east. We arrive on the top ledge of a large room. Exploring the perimeter, we can loot the body of a ghoul we killed earlier in a couple of containers. Heading around to the northern side, we find a staircase that leads down. We can take care of a final ghoul and then explore this bottom level, which appears to be a library. We see a door back to Appalachia behind us, and the library to the south. We find lots of containers with scrap, but nothing of interest in the library. And with that, we've completed the entire university. The hallway to the west just leads back to the door to the simulation vault that we came out of. And so we can choose any of the doors to leave the vault that we wish. We leave with a better understanding of how Vault Tech went about finding overseers for their vaults. Though there are a few vaults that don't fit with this paradigm. Vault 114 in Boston, for example, seemed to just randomly interview people off the street before choosing the stupidest guy to make overseer. This was the vault where we found Nick Valentine. But for most of the overseers, it appears that Vault Tech gave them all strenuous, intensive training. Though I have to admit, I wouldn't want to be operated on by any of these medically trained overseers, and we walk away with a list of other places to explore. The AVR Medical Center, where vault Tech overseers in training went to assist in emergency room diagnoses. The Horse Creek Petroglyphs, that's so interested Professor Blake. And we need to find Jacqueline, Agent Wilson, and whatever codes they were carrying. Could this be the key that unlocks access to some sort of alien technology? And finally, we need to track down Shelby O'Rourke, she was the student that the Dean allowed to go and study cryptids. We have to find her shack and see if we can recover any research that she completed. We'll be sure to tackle all of these tasks in upcoming videos. What are your thoughts on vault University? Did you find all the loot, including the bobblehead? And did you discover that the Dean was responsible for the failure of Overseer Cullingworth's experiment, ultimately leading to deaths? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week here on my channel, as well as host multiple live streams each week. So if you want to make sure you don't miss anything Fallout or Fallout 76 related, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. The designs come on other stuff as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon this week with more brand new videos.